for, and we're here in Durham, North Carolina. We're in the basketball uh, Hall of Fame area, the basketball museum here, uh, right attached to Cameron Indoor Stadium. And we're here today to talk about Duke Carolina basketball, and especially a lot about Duke basketball. And we have one of the true legends of Duke basketball with us, a man by the name of Kenny Denard, one of the great players at Duke from 1978 to 1981. Uh, Kenny, I guess I want to start right off with you, and let's start off first off about this season. Tell me about this Duke basketball team. What do you know, and how are they doing so far? I know nothing. <laughs> no, really, Johnny. I don't invest in these kids until they get out on the court and show me something. And then around February, I figure out that you know what I like. You can't read anything into the first anything before. There's like three seasons in the way I see college sports today, college basketball. You've got before Christmas, then the conference season play, then the tournaments. So the first season is really just to kind of entertain us and check out what's going on. I think this team is going to be very entertaining. I think it's going to be one of the fastest-paced teams we've seen probably since ours, if I, must, if I may be so bold. We were a pretty fast team. You know, we averaged uh, 80-something points a game without a three-point shot clock and um, without a, uh, a three-point shot. So it's going to be fun to watch this team in the first season. Second season... You know, with the new configuration of the ACC, it's going to be different for fans. You know, it's going to be different for players and coaches. So, and then, of course, the tournament, then we'll know from injuries to rhythm to who's peaked and who's not, who gets it going. I always can say I put my money on Coach K no matter what. But as far as the team itself, I think he that's what he loves doing is figuring out a team and and putting them in the position to grow and become really close and trust each other and just go kick some butt. Well, let's talk about that a minute with Coach K. You have a very unique perspective there because you were on the first basketball team that he had here at Duke University. Uh, talk a little bit about what Mike brought to the team and what you saw in him that maybe you realized he might be a great coach one day. Well, you know, you, at 33 years old, he was only 10 years older than Gene and I. So it was really, you know, we had had some tremendous success uh, from 78, 79. And then, uh, I, I, hold on, hang on. I can't talk right now. I'm going to have to put you on. Yeah, sorry, I'm in my office. No, I'll call, I'll call him. Sorry about that. I forgot to put my uh, phone on Do Not Disturb. I do work for a living, too, so that's kind of fun. Anyway, um, Coach K came into our situation, why eyes wide open, and of course he got a lot to look at with Gene and I. So we had a big time, and he wasn't any kind. You know, everybody was saying he's going to be this real disciplinarian, but he turned out to be really patient. Are you talking to me, Johnny? I'm looking yeah. at you. Okay, yeah. no, I'm looking at you. You give yeah, me hand signals. I mean, but he was 33, you were 23. There wasn't a whole lot of disciplinarian going at that time. I mean, you were a senior on the basketball team. So you took some of the stuff that he taught you, and as you watched over the years, as he's gotten better as a coach? Oh, light years. No, nothing I can say hasn't been said or won't be said. So Coach K has done – I just tell people that for me, our, anybody who went to Duke, anybody who ever played at Duke, Coach K has all made us better in life in many ways beyond this basketball game. So uh, when I am in business or when I'm in my personal life and somebody says, oh, you went to Duke, even before, you know, they look at me and they don't think I played basketball. They go, what, what, what were you, a tackle? Were you a, a you know, tight end? And I tell them, no, I played basketball about 120 pounds ago, not how many years ago. But, you know, when I am around the country and, and people know that I went to Duke, they, they look at me different. And it's not because of me. And I don't, I mean, Duke is obviously a great school, and I'm not cracking it, but so is Princeton. But when you say you you went to play basketball at Princeton, <coughs> sorry, but when then you say you played basketball at Duke and Coach K was your, 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 you were his captain, his first captain your senior year, it just makes it easy for conversation. Talk about those years at Duke a minute. You were a kid who came from King, North Carolina, into uh, Duke University. Uh, Ford that came in the same time with uh, one of the most prolific players in high school, a guy by the name of Gene Banks, came in a 
West Philly High School and had all the publicity. Talk about those years of coming in, playing with Tinker, and especially what it was like that freshman year between you, both of you guys. Yeah, Johnny, you were there, so you saw it. Uh, really, the magic between Gene and I, which I call it literally magic, the, the relationship we developed, came from really the summer before our freshman years, between our senior year and freshman year at Duke. We were both in Durham. Uh, both living there, he was in pre—he was in preschool, I guess, summer school, and I was working odd jobs and and just being there too. We played every night over at the IM building. In fact, Lou Getz, who was in the audience there uh, earlier, uh, those guys—it was a lot of real stringent rules about what you could or couldn't do. But they were ripping up the floor at Cameron Indoor Stadium, that old old floor for years, kind of darker wood, putting in a new floor. So we practiced all summer and that into the fall at the IM building, which had a rubber floor, and it had metal steel girder beams, and it had a, you know, kind of a fab, prefab building. In those games, at that time, some of the greatest summer games I've ever played in, and I played in many years after that, where Gene and I would just light each other up. And that's when, you know, I would guard him, he would guard me. Not that I was any kind of offensive machine like Gene, but we had so much fun and so much respect. I mean, we battled and battled, but it wasn't like we were battling for the same position. We were just battling as competitors. And I think Lou has has some really good insight. That was really where it started for Gene and I. And then it just continued. And we're blood brothers, uh, dark blue blood brothers to this day. Let's talk about that magic. That magic worked pretty well for you. Your senior year and your final game against uh, Carolina and Cameron Indoor Stadium. There, and to go back on that, Carolina scored and made it 58-56. There were two great inbound passes that you had to make. One was to Chip England for the timeout, and then one was to Gene Banks, who made the shot to put the game in overtime. Talk about that game a little bit and what happened during that whole time period there right at the end of the game, Kenny. Well, that's very. Th I thank you for saying uh, about my passes, but you know, the, the, it's it's a team effort. It's one of the nice and part of you know I'm writing this book and I've got these backstories and you know secrets have no expiration date in it. So one of the stories I tell in this in this book is about that moment when two seconds to go, tie ball game, Sam Perkins at the line. We have one timeout. We're at home, senior day. Uh, Perkins hit, Coach K says if he hits, whatever, call timeout. If he hits them both or you get a rebound, just call timeout. Well, he made them both. And before I could call timeout, Dean Smith called timeout. So that gave us an extra timeout, which was a real tactical error. And, you know, I love Dean Smith like a father because he's been so influential in my life beyond basketball. And so when I look at the – we go into the to the huddle – Coach K says, let's just get it to half court, call timeout. So we wouldn't have had that opportunity uh, to, to with that because we only had one timeout. So we threw it to, threw it to, to uh, Tommy Emma at half court, God rest his soul. Then timeout, we came into this huddle, and the huddle was a real interesting. And I like to – and Coach K likes to kid about it too. We, we giggle about it because – he called the play for Chip England. He thought, okay, everybody's going to be thinking I was going to throw it to Gene. Uh, so let's use Gene as a decoy. And Chip, who's a hell of a shooter, no question. He's a great shooter. But he was a sophomore, and this was our senior night. So he drew the play up, and he, Gene was supposed to pick down, down the baseline, and Chip come over to the sideline and hit a corner jumper. Well, when we broke the huddle, you know, I looked at Gene, and he looked at me, and we didn't even really have to talk. And he goes, I said, you know what to do, come to the top. You know, he said, good doggy, good doggy. So we that's the way it, it played out. It was a magical play. You know, with some observer, I mean, you, you're in that zone. You don't really know exactly what happened until you go back and look at it. But one person said it eloquently that there was only one second on the clock. How are you going to get a shot off? especially with Gene coming to me to the top of the key. Well, I didn't know I was doing it, but this observer said, I threw, I passed him open. I, I threw him open. You know, like I led him to where he had to turn. It wasn't something that I consciously did. It was probably more luck than anything. 
But if I'd have thrown it directly to him and he had to turn, he probably wouldn't have had time to get the shot off. But it just the way it was all part of this magic, and then it went in, and the place went crazy. And Kim, you were there. It was the most – I've been to – we beat Carolina several times that I've been to that it was almost as loud, but it wasn't as loud for over a minute. It went loud for over a minute that you could not – all you did was have goosebumps, and you just had you know, your hair was standing on its end. It was just an unbelievable experience. And like I said in the documentary, the Blue, the Blue Blood Rivalry documentary, it was the greatest winning experience in my lifetime, and I've had a few, but that one was it. Well, let's take a moment here and introduce the uh, four other people with us today. Kim Wooten is from Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, Dan Levine is from New York City. Ray Kennedy from Mobile, Alabama, and Todd Jones from Durham. And, and let's go back. Let's see here. Kim, talk a little bit about that night. You were there that night when uh, when Kenny made a great pass. Well, it's just mayhem uh, is all, all I can say. It's the most joyous moment I ever experienced as a Duke basketball fan, at least up to that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, to see Gene and Kenny be able to do that. I remember uh, afterwards... There were some uh, shirts that we made up. Ken, do you remember those that said uh, uh, Denard and Banks, goodbye and thanks? Do you remember uh, those? Yeah, it was a uh, guy, I guess they handed him out, Denard and Banks, so long and thanks. Yeah, yeah. With a basketball there on the chest. Yeah, and, and that's how much everyone uh, appreciated the efforts that these guys had made during that game and how much we loved them, you know, throughout their career. But that was an awesome night, i got to say. And, you know, the, the Bruce Springsteen concert was afterwards, too. So Bruce it was Springsteen. just all in and all. I, and I was, I was there with you. I went there and uh, vibrated in my seat the whole night. Yes. <laughs> it was fun. It was a great night, wasn't it? Yes. Now, Dan, you, you were a year out of school, but do you remember that night as well? You're on mute. Let's switch over. Ray, do you remember that night at all? Well, I wasn't there. Uh, I knew Kenny after he left, and but I have seen it with him, and uh, he's viewed it, you know, the tape and so forth, and I, I think he still gets chill bumps when he watches <laughs> some of those uh, big times that he did. Yeah, that was very impressive That with the passing. I've always gone back and thought about that. The first pass to Chip England. Now, Kenny... Didn't you throw down at Clemson? Wasn't that same place set up for uh, for Chip when he missed a shot down in Clemson in overtime back when he was a freshman? I don't remember, Johnny. You know, one of the things that is part of my success in life is I don't really remember bad shit. <laughs> I'm sure, exactly. Well, let me go to one other game that everybody remembers, and Dan will remember this one real well. The game against North Carolina when it was 7 nothing at halftime. You had some real special remembrances about that, Kenny. Yes, I did. The uh, thing that most impressed me about our fans, they were not called the Cameron Crazies at that time. The fans, we we were just you know Duke students that did some crazy stuff. Uh, the fans were so, you know, the, with the holding of the ball for like nine or ten minutes, at one point, you know, because we're trying to do jumping jacks, we're like jumping around, like trying to stay active and bounce around, and they have to pass the ball over the hash mark so that they're not called for delay of game or some sort of penalty. So we're doing this dance. It's really a dance, kind of like a little, rob a little robicizing. And then all of a sudden the fans, the whole student section started hissing like And I'm telling you, in 30 seconds my feet started to feel like I was on fire. I felt like I was in a frying pan. That was a most amazing physical experience from it's almost like a hallucination or self-induced tra uh, trauma. From it was amazing, and, and I don't know if anybody was there that remembers that. It was about a minute or two minute period that, and then Chicky then went around and the, you know the passed the ball, blah blah blah, and then he took that shot that we forced him down on the baseline, or Gene and G-Man did, and you know the, of course the trivia question I like to ask people is who caught Chicky's air ball, and that would be me. So. <laughs> Always a rebounder, right? Was that well, the weirdest half of basketball you ever played? Yeah, the two shots that Carolina took in that half were both air balls. Peppers uh, tried to shoot a shot at uh, the buzzer at, at the end of the uh, first half, and it was an air ball. So, yeah, 
And then they came out and played a straight up 40 to 40 in the second half, so we won 47 40. And but it was one of those games that goes down in memory. Uh, you know, people don't really uh, remember Michael Jordan playing Duke in any game when he was there. I don't. There wasn't any special game. But you remember the game that Jeff Capel hit that shot uh, to put it into overtime, even though Duke lost. And Jeff Capel didn't turn out to be a Michael Jordan. So it's not about the players' skills or the players, uh, what they do after. It's those moments that live forever in the, the, the Duke-UNC blue, bu- blue blood rivalry. Let's see a minute. Dan, are you on mute? Or, or no, I'm we... back. I'm okay, okay. You, you were in that class. You had to be at that game, the 7 nothing game. I mean, you knew all about that. Well, do you remember it very well? Yeah, I, I remember the game, but, but like Kenny says, it's, it's not about the individual game. What makes that time amazing is we were witness, live witness to the greatest basketball in the country going on, and we would just walk from our lunch into Duke Cameron, into the indoor stadium, and if you were in a fraternity, you knew you were sitting over here, and if you were in a sorority, you were sitting over here, and it was a small community. And we were there when we beat Caroline for the first time in a long time, and we were there for the 7 nothing game. And I think there's such brotherhood between those classes because we all experienced this amazing, these amazing events in a really small community. And it yeah. end. You're right. The 78 game was really big. That's when Carolina was ranked second in the country, and uh, Duke beat them here. And uh, these guys were freshmen at the time. That was a big win for Duke at that time. I remember I remember being upset because it was so crowded that when we got in, I had to go upstairs to get a seat, you know? Yep. Yep, the old, student, the old graduate in the student section in 9 and 10 uh, in those days before they brought the graduate students downstairs. You know, Johnny, that was uh, – it's Kenny, Kenny again. That was the night that I went to Manila's for the first time after that win. <laughs> uh, okay, we need to move on. Uh, <laughs> Todd, what are your remembrances of uh, of Kenny? The ones that we can air on uh, on on uh, internet. He looked good in really small shorts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, when you look back, I don't mean to interrupt Todd, but when you look back, those little shorts, he looked good, that Carolina boy. <laughs> well, with, with the constraints of. Uh, of decorum, I'll just say that, that Kenny was kind of a mythical figure around campus uh, in, in many dimensions, not just athletically. And uh, he was known as someone who uh, right. embraced life by the throat and maybe some other areas and and, <laughs> and took it for all it was worth. So, uh, you know, he, he had this aura about him, but at the same time was very down to earth and friendly and uh, everyone, wanted to, everyone wanted to be Kenny's friend. Ray, I know you talked about the fact that you really didn't know him that much when he was a player, but later on, that's still the same type Kenny, isn't it? Didn't Todd just uh, uh, tell us exactly how Kenny is now? Precisely. It was, uh, you know, he being from Alabama, uh, my my sports prior to that was pretty heavily to a football team up near Tuscaloosa, and Kenny really turned me into a, a big Duke fan and I followed him very closely and Kenny hadn't changed a bit a pound or two maybe but he's uh, still full of life, full of energy and and always has good things to say about people so I think he may have been a little wilder at college but he's certainly the same person you know Kenny we, we talked a few minutes yesterday on the phone about that 78 team you guys were a mismatch of people I mean, Jimmy Spinarco from New Jersey, really a good captain. Mike Jeminski from Connecticut, who graduated a year early. You had you from King, North Carolina. Gene Banks from uh, the Philadelphia area. Bob Bender, a transfer in from Indiana. Johnny Gunn, Johnny Harrell, really a good guard from uh, the Durham area. I mean, it, it's amazing how that team was ever able to come together. And I always thought you were a big glue on that team because you were a guy who had a good time with this basketball team. Well, you know, I think the the world was a different place. You know, the media outlets were different. There was a whole different – I mean, we were coming off the 
age of the sexual revolution and power to the people, you know, the storming of the Allen administrative building in the early 70s, uh, all the free love and the dope smoking, and it became, a, you know, we were at the tail end of that. So there was a national TV with basketball started picking up. You know, we may have been on national TV four or five times a year my sophomore, junior year, and they thought we were overexposed. You know, it's just a different era back then. So I think you were able to have a little more time to develop a, a team camaraderie, a team personality. And we certainly had the characters on that team. But I know the guys at Wake and at Carolina and, and Maryland and Virginia, Lee Raker and, and Jeff Lamp and Terry Gates. And I knew all those. They all had different types of characters, too. But our characters seem to you know, just take off. Our, our, our team character with our different individuals, our different personalities, were matched up and the chemistry was so good and the coaching was, was you know, very, very, um, I don't know the proper word, but it wasn't relaxed, but it was, it allowed us to be who we were within a framework. And that, you know, it wasn't like anything I've ever experienced before or after. So, that team had the ability of a once in a lifetime. I mean, you know, Feinstein wrote his book about us, and people still remember everywhere I go, and they find out, oh, you're on a 78 team. That's what made me a Duke fan. Those are the best feelings that I get when, you know, thinking back about how many people we turned on to Duke basketball after a 12 year kind of dead spell, dry spell. But the, the also the, 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 the life and, and, uh, and real laughter. The, the sarcasm, the, the dry humor, the we're still a team to this day, and it's been 30, what, uh, five years. So it's but amazing. You know, it's amazing. Kenny, but you did have, you did have a, a special spark, and I think uh, that was the blue. You might not have been you know, considered the best player, but you were certainly the emotional blue. I saw that Madison Square Garden, I believe, 1980. Wayne McCoy. That was seventy nine. Seventy nine. Do you remember that? Actually, actually, it was December of seventy eight. Uh, December of seventy eight. Yeah, yeah. I remember the exact day, the exact. Mem I, you know, I remember the exact time he kicked me in the back of the head, in the corner at Madison Square Garden. I remember when my brains shook like I'd been hit by a train, and I remember the next day. I know I'm trying to body slam him at the other end of the court. Uh, after running, you know, my parents were watching that game on uh, MSG down in Fort Myers, Florida, where they had a summer or a winter place. And you know how they piped down MSG back then to all the New Yorkers who were snowbirds. She said, my mom said, you know, those 19-inch TVs were the big deal back then. She goes, we're watching the game and you're not in the screen. All of a sudden you come running across like out of nowhere and try to hit this big black man. What was wrong with you? And I said, honey, you just didn't get to see the whole thing. But and thank uh, goodness we had our own big guy because uh, Gene Banks grabbed hold of Wayne McCoy before you took care of him. You know, and and that's what he, a, a brother like Gene does. I just pussied out and didn't punch him like you're supposed to in a fight. You know, if you hold him back, you're supposed to punch. And I just, just lost it. I just... <laughs> hey, Kenny, go back to one thing on the 78 team, Bill Foster. Was Foster just happened to be the right coach for that team? Yeah, I think so. If you think about how that team came together, it's an amazing uh, recruiting story where Jim Spinarco, the textbook pigeon-toed incredible player, you know, he's a pigeon-toed textbook of basketball. He he had the best anticipate of all, you know, because I like to try and be ahead of when you do steals or you're trying to outthink the other players and get ahead of them. Jim Spinarco was like Larry Bird in that manner. He could automatically anticipate what was going to happen. And so, like, Bird didn't have great physical characteristics like, say, a LeBron or Jordan or whatever. He could anticipate, Spinarco could anticipate, and be ahead of the play and get things done, be disruptive, get steals, make turnovers, make the right pass. He just had that knack. And, uh, you know, that, 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 I don't know, I just kind of got lost in thinking about Jim Spinarco. I love you, Jim. 
about Coach Foster. Oh yeah. So Jim, Fo uh, Bill Foster recruited Jim Spinarkle, who was Rookie of the Year in '76. Then he got this guy who didn't even get on the radar because Mike Jemisky skipped his senior year in high school to come to Duke, who was Rookie of the Year in '77. And somehow or another, we still don't know the real story why Gene Banks chose Duke over Notre Dame. And Gene comes to Duke, and he was Rookie of the Year. So we had three Rookies of the Year in the ACC back to back to back. I don't think that's happened anywhere before or since. Um, so putting those components together, after coming off of the Kevin Billerman, who we all, many of you know, a great buddy and coach in the high school at Ravenscroft, who coached Ryan Kelly, Kevin played for three different coaches in three different years at Duke. You know, so there had been some unsettled times. So Coach Foster was really coming in with a sharp wit, a sense of humor. He could laugh and make fun of himself. He could get boosters interested. He could get players interested. And certainly he his best – I re, I repeat this to, to people all the time. Uh, Coach Foster used to say, we recruit prospects, not suspects. So that was uh, that was a – Something I thought was unique when I, of course, I was recruited by Norm Sloan and some other uh, rump wrangling vigilantes like that that just would promise you, oh, yeah, you're going to start if you come to state, boy. You know, and then you'd have to shower after you leave the room because you just felt so slimy. So Bill was Bill was a special coach, and uh, God bless him. Do you feel like, looking back, that you guys were the foundation for kind of what's happening now? No, I really think that goes back to the Art Heyman era. I think you have to have that, and you have to have um, really the fire. You know, if you look at this Blue Devil uh, Tar Heel rivalry, it goes back to kind of that as the genesis. And I really think that's when you know Duke had some down years. But if you look at the sign and cosine of the programs uh, through the years, you're going to have some down times, and and that was. But I think really. You know, that was probably Artie Heyman's team and then Mullins and Jeff, um, oh, I forgot Jeff's last name. Johnny, help me. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Mullins? Jeff Mullins, yeah. Jeff Mullins. Jeff Mullins. Yeah, sorry, I had a senior. Jack and everything, here. I understand. It's a cholesterol medicine. You know, you take cholesterol medicine and it really takes your cholesterol down, but your memory goes to shit. So... Um, <laughs> Damn cholesterol medicine. So anyway, and then of course uh, Jack Marin and all, all you could name all the guys in the 60s. Right. Had a little dip in the 70s, and then we we came back. And right. certainly, whatever anybody wants to say, I, I don't. I think we were part of that continuum in an upsurge, but I wouldn't say that today's program is built on us. I would say it really started back in the early 60s. Kim, talk about that a little bit about that whole basis. I mean, that 78 group. That was a good family. That really started things off for Duke basketball. Yeah, um, you know, and when I came, my, my first year at Duke was Coach K's first year at Duke, and so uh, we didn't really know what to expect. We did know that we had some guys like Kenny and Gene that were gonna kind of take our program and 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 keep it going, but we didn't know where we were going. Uh, you know, with those guys uh, leaving us and Coach K coming on and. Uh, just uh, it just kept getting better and better. We had a couple of, of down years in the first, as everybody knows, uh, Coach K's first couple of years. But uh, I do remember uh, very clearly hearing my favorite uh, Bill Foster quote, and that was uh, in regard to the seven to nothing game in the four corners. Uh, I believe, as the story goes, Bill Foster said, "I thought Dean Smith invented basketball, not Dean Smith." Um, that was his commentary. So. That was one of my favorite moments, uh, Bill Foster-wise. But uh, we we were very fortunate to come in at a time where Kenny and Gene uh, were leading our team, and we were able to beat Carolina while I was there, and uh, to see Coach Case sort of start to build our program. It was it was a wonderful time to be there, and like Dan said, it was great to be able to just walk up into Cameron and sit down. Uh, you know, when the game started at 7:30, you know, you got down there in line at 7:15. That was a pretty great time to be here. Hey, Todd, being from Durham, talk about your remembrances a little bit on the Duke Carolina stuff because you got to be a little different for a hometown guy. Oh, it was it was often very painful. Uh, 
my father was on faculty at Duke, so I was going to games in Cameron since the mid-60s, uh, and he was a huge sports fan, so I, I my loyalty uh, started early and remained very deep. And going to the, the Durham Public Schools, uh, it felt like Durham was the, the only uh, college town in the U.S. where the, the home team was, was in the minority in terms of who rooted for whom. So, uh, you know, as soon as you were uh, identified as a Duke fan, uh, any time that Carolina would, would eke out a win, as I prefer to put it, it, it was really hard going to school the next day. And you knew you were going to get ribbed and taunted and you'd hear chants about something about eight points in 17 seconds, uh, which I've long since repressed. But uh, it was always difficult. Uh, you know, the, especially during the uh, the early 70s when uh, Carolina was was clearly superior, and uh, so the moments where we caught up to them and surpassed them were delicious indeed. You, you know, Ray, being from Alabama, you're in a pretty big football state to say the least. <laughs> Talk about the impact of Duke basketball in your area of the country. Well, it's with the uh, advent of so many games on TV and uh, the coverage now, uh, Duke is a very, very popular uh, school down here for basketball. And, uh, of course, you know, as you said, Alabama football is, is king in this state. Well, but, plus, Ray, uh, Antonio Lang was from Mobile, wasn't he? Sure yes, was. he was. Yeah, he sure was. And uh, it's just really, I, I can tell you that uh, people who know that I'm a Duke fan because of Kenny and, and grown to be a very big Duke fan, they'll, they'll ask me about the game or something. And so there's so many people now that are involved in uh, watching and, and understanding Duke basketball. And it, it's totally different from what I understood before I became such a big fan. I've been to a few tournaments and... Uh, it's just amazing, and so down here you would be, you might be surprised at how many people follow Duke basketball. And, and you know, Dan, being from that special time, you were an '80 grad. Uh, Mike Jaminski, Bob Bender, there's a bunch of them still call that the great class of '80. But uh, being an '80 grad, you were with that special team. Must be a lot of fun just being a Duke basketball fan, not recently, but having been one for a long time. You know, it's funny. Everybody says, oh, you must be so excited for the season. And when we're, we come from back then, you know, I sort of agree with what Kenny said. Around February, we start looking at, you know, what's going on. You know, I mean, this was, it was a special time. And it was, I mean, it, it, it's hard to put into words well, if I go back to the community aspect of it. I mean, they would finished their game. You know, at the time, I was working uh, for Duke uh, Cable Television where we would, a lot of the games, we would live broadcast them right on the campus. And you're down right on the basketball court with, with uh, the greatest players in the country. And then after the game, everybody's in the CI, the Cambridge Inn, having a beer. Oh, wait, did we have a beer? Yeah, we yeah, had a beer. Yeah, you could drink at 18 back then. That was right. okay. <laughs> right. And, you know, it, it, it was like high school. It really was like high school. It was a big high school. And nobody was there with their camera phone or trying to make something out of whatever they're, you know, these poor kids today, you know, not to interrupt, but these kids today have no chance of any kind of normal life. One of the reasons I chose Duke over Carolina, for example, because I was recruited there, and of course I'd tell everybody I didn't want to put this guy named Michael Korn on the bench for three years because, uh, you know, that's why I didn't go there. But I really didn't go there because I didn't want to live in a dorm. He would have. And Michael Korn was ugly. Yeah, Michael he was. Was ugly. <laughs> all, a, all ACC ugly, him and Brad Davis. But I didn't want to live in a dorm with the players. They all lived together over in Granville. And it was I wanted to be able to have a real life. And that has paid off. That gut instinct to go to Duke and to beg Coach Foster to let me come there because I was an early, uh, I early committed in November before people did such things because I didn't want him to give my spot up I early committed. He said he wouldn't recruit over me. So, and he lived up to his word, and that changed my life. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a lot of fun. Can I add one thing, Johnny, before we go? You always can, Kenny. Yes, of course. <laughs> like I said yesterday, I want everybody on this broadcast or whoever watches it replay that Gene Banks, Kenny Denard, and Jim Suddeth, the three seniors that year from the 80 class of 81, 
We played in this rivalry 14 games, the most of any players. Uh, in you know, there was a couple of guys on the Carolina team, Al Wood, and uh, I can't remember if I don't think Budco played or Pete Dudco. Nothing personal, Pete. But 14 games in four years in the rivalry, which is the most of any era. And let me tell you, it was the most fun because it was bitter blood on the court. We didn't have as much of the bitter blood that people may think off the court for each other. But when we played, whether it was in the summer or in the, in the, in the winter during these games, it was you wanted to kill them. You wanted to beat them. You wanted to make them your bitch. Anyway, uh, thanks for having me on. That's it. That's exactly what the Duke Carolina rivalry is about. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you.